Good evening and welcome to uh, Race Church Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, I have one announcement before we turn to our text. COVID-19 cases are soaring in Oconee County right now to the point that we've decided that safety requires that we cease in-person worship for a time. So we'll not have in-person services during the month of January. We will be monitoring the pandemic statistics weekly and will return to in-person worship as soon as it's safe. In the meantime, we will continue to publish uh, a service on YouTube each Sunday uh, by 11 a.m. and we'll continue this virtual Bible study each Wednesday evening. Uh, the lesson that uh, we're going to do tonight is actually a continuation of the lesson from our last meeting and it's the text is John 2 uh, 1 through 11 and that text tells us uh, the story of Jesus's first miracle uh, at Cana where he changed water uh, into wine uh, and in in that lesson you might recall I, I uh, uh, pointed out that Miracles uh, often accompanied uh, God's activity in the world from the very beginning of time. And the New Testament is clear that God desires that to continue through the church. Even as Jesus in this miracle at Cana, it says when that miracle occurred, his, uh, his, uh, Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, talk of miracles uh, makes uh, some people uh, very nervous and even many Christians. Now there's several reasons for that and I'm going to cover four of those this evening uh, to complete our study of that uh, John text. First, we live in a secularized, educated, and uh, scientific-minded society. People are reluctant to accept anything that cannot be measured, tested, or proven uh, in a laboratory. Now, we might expect uh, unbelievers, uh, people who are not Christians, to accept that premise, but many in the church also decry miracles on that basis. There, there are even some uh, in the church today uh, that... Uh, that doubt whether or not the miracles in the Bible uh, really happened. And you know, that should not be. I mean, we become Christians by the new birth, by being born again. That in, in and of itself is a miracle. The first line of the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. When you say you believe those words, you've removed the word impossible uh, from the vocabulary we use to talk about God. So this just should not be. Regardless of our society, God is not limited by science as, as we are. Now, the second reason is that some Christians have believed the doctrinal teaching that miracles were confined uh, for earlier periods and it needed that the church needed those miracles to get established uh, in society and after that need for miracles ceased which was either at the death of the last apostle or maybe at the end of the first century or some other period of time or maybe the canonization of scripture uh, now that is not a new history I mean a new heresy uh, it, it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, John Wesley, uh, the founder of Methodism, along with his brother Charles and several other uh, English clergy, uh, were accused uh, of heresy on that simple basis because miracles were happening. Witnesses were talking about miracles that happened in those Methodist meetings. And this bishop published a tract saying that was heresy because of this doctrine of the church that miracles passed away at some point in time. And I just want to read to you the Reverend John Wesley's scathing response, just a part of it. 
it, it was actually about 30 pages uh, in my book of Wesley's works, but just this one paragraph. He said, uh, <clears throat> Yet I do not know that God hath anywhere precluded himself from thus exerting his sovereign power from working miracles in any kind or degree in any age to the end of the world. I do not uh, recollect any scripture wherein we are taught that miracles were to be confined within the limits of either the apostolic or the Cyprianic age or for any period of time, longer or shorter, even till the restitution of all things. That's pretty clear. Uh, that's not a valid reason uh, to me as well. I, I believe Wesley was right on target. <clears throat> now, the third reason is that people in general, and including many Christians, uh, typically prefer to keep God at a safe distance because they are afraid of what might happen if God gets too close. Miracles make God present and real, very close. And if one is trying to keep God at a distance, miracles are a problem. Miracles are also a pain for those who prefer uh, very calm, very sensible, civilized, and controlled religion. I, when I say controlled, I mean humanly controlled. When miracles appear, uh, occur, people get emotional. They get excited. They, they sometimes out of control. Well, the one guy that, that uh, Jesus healed and Jesus told him to be quiet about it, and he went skipping and hopping and jumping uh, through the temple uh, telling everybody what happened. Understandably, uh, and understandably so. I mean, if you, if you were blind and God opened your eyes, wouldn't you be excited? I would think you would. If you saw God heal a family member uh, of an incurable disease, wouldn't that elicit some tremendous emotional response in you? <laughs> well, if it didn't, uh, the thought came to me, we'd have to get God to raise you from the dead. Of course it would. Of course it would. It is really simple to me. If you want to keep God at a distance, if you want religion that is calm, civilized, devoid of excitement and emotion and under human control, don't hang around with Jesus. Uh, real Christianity, sold out Christianity is not for you. Now, the fourth reason stems from several texts uh, like the one I'm going to read, which is really uh, the center of our text tonight. And it's in Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. And there are other texts like this. I, I, I don't think we need to read them all. I'll just read this one. Words of Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, meaning the end day, uh, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Now, that is somewhat frightening, isn't it? To think that we get caught up in some kind of miracle show only to discover it's the devil. Well, how will we know the difference? Well, one way we can know the difference is don't take a few verses out of context. Read the whole passage. You go back earlier to Matthew, in Matthew 7. Jesus tells us they're going to be false Christ. They're going to be false prophets, and they're going to do miracles. And he tells us how to recognize the false prophets. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of what is happening. If it's revival going on in some church, what is the fruit of what is happening there? And what is the fruit of the lies of those who are involved, the leadership, preachers? 
Are people getting saved? Are lives being changed? Is the person up front directing attention to Jesus or to him or herself? Do they talk about money as much as they talk about Jesus? Mark 13, 22, uh, Jesus said this, for false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, the elect being believers, the church. So they would, they would, would rise up and appear to perform signs, wonders, and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. In other words, they're going to try it, but it's not possible. Because God provides protection for his people who are genuinely and earnestly seeking after him. So I believe we can move into the miraculous without fear. We just need to make sure we keep the main thing, the main thing, Jesus. It's not about me or any other preacher. It's not about miracles. It's not about church. It's not about money. It's all about Jesus and the furtherance of his kingdom. If we stay focused on that, we need have no fear. Well, that's my four reasons that I think people avoid or get nervous about miracles. The next question, the last thing we'll cover is, is just how do we do it? How do we move into the miraculous? I, I hate to bring this up. I, I feel like I have to, but... but I feel I don't want to bring it up because I, I don't, I'm not sure I know the answer. I mean, I've never been able to fully realize this goal myself, but I've skirted around the edges a good bit, and, and I do have some thoughts on the subject. First of all, it is not so much what we do. It's our attitude. It's our faith. It's our expectation in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, it says that he, meaning Jesus, could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, he was talking about Nazareth, where people knew Jesus, where he was familiar to them. When, when he said, it's, it's only in his hometown, is a prophet without honor. Now, <clears throat> The reason given by Mark was that they had such little faith. They meaning the community, the whole community, the village. But you know, when you get right down to it, I wish we had as much faith as they did. Never how much it was, because I would start, be glad to start with a few sick people getting healed, which was all that happened there. Now, Keep in mind that I'm not talking about God healing through medicine. And I know we pray for people and they get well and, and uh, they go to the doctor, they get some medicine or, or some surgeon can do a special surgery that helps them. And I believe every good and perfect gift is from God. I believe that's one way uh, God heals is, is through medical science. But that's not the kind of healing I'm talking about now. I'm talking about healing that, that, that we see a lot in revivals and breakouts of, in evangelism. I'm referring to the, the blind and the deaf and the diseased walking away from an altar healed instantly through prayer. I'm talking about drug addicts and alcoholics being delivered in an instant. You know, the news show uh, 2020 did a special in 1997 about a long-running revival uh, that occurred at Brownsville Assembly of God Church in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, Beverly and I were involved in a way. We, we made several trips there, went to that revival and conferences for pastors and their families uh, that were held in Pensacola. But on that TV show, they interviewed a young man who had been a white supremacist. He hated everyone that wasn't white. In fact, I think he just hated everyone. He confessed that he'd made a man, plan to murder his parents. 
But somehow, some way, and I don't remember those details, someone got him to go to that revival meeting. He responded to the altar call that night, and in an instant of time, just that quick, God set him free, and God transformed all the hate that was built up in that young man and just melted it into love. And he talked like the sweetest young man you had ever, ever talked to. That's the kind of miracle I'm talking about. It's a lack, if a lack of faith in a community like Jesus' hometown can foster an atmosphere in which Jesus cannot do many miracles, it would seem to me the opposite is also true. But God is sovereign. And he can choose to do or not to do miracles regardless of what we do or don't do. However, I do think that we should endeavor to create an atmosphere conducive to miracles because God has demonstrated that he often chooses to do them to affirm the gospel and that it's that kind of atmosphere that is fosters those miracles. Now, <clears throat> moving into the miraculous may require a change in attitude, a change in what we expect in our relationship with God. Someone once said that if you expect nothing, you will most likely get what you expect. <laughs> if we come to church expecting only good music, solid preaching, and fellowship, I trust God will continue to give us the grace to deliver those. Those are good things. But I would prefer that we would also come to church expecting to experience the miracle power of God both in our lives and the lives of others who may come, whether or not there be any singing, preaching, or fellowship. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your love and mercy. We're grateful uh, that you've revealed to us your purposes and intents in this world. Help us, God, to be open to the movement of your spirit in our lives, in our church, in any, all aspects of our, uh, of our living. Expect us to do the very thing that only God can do. Help us, God to expect your miracle power to be evident in our worshiping, in our witness, in our praying, that our community will be challenged to come to terms with the reality of your presence in our world. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us this evening. And uh, we'll be back here uh, next Wednesday evening. Uh, for our Bible study lesson, we'll continue on uh, with in, uh, John's uh, in John's gospel. Uh, we will have, uh, as I said, online services only uh, at our church service uh, on Sunday morning. So God be with you. God bless you. Please be safe. And let's stand firm uh, and, and try to do everything we can uh, to, to be safe as we continue to battle this coronavirus. Uh, pandemic. Uh, God bless you until we uh, meet again.